Welcome to this video on Agendas and Incarnations from the tabletop role-playing game Demon The Descent. The demons of this game, the fallen angels, are demons of a different kind than what you might be used to. Rather than being the losers of a prehistoric war against heaven, they were something along the lines of occult computer programs, highly sophisticated, powerful, but lacking in self-awareness, and bound in service to their creator, the demiurgic god machine, until the angels questioned their purpose and thereby, unwittingly perhaps, severed themselves from the god machine. The former angels, now demons, or in their parlance, unchained, seek to descend into hell, a state of being, or perhaps an actual place, where they can be completely free of their former god's control. Incarnations are what a demon once was as an angel, the programming and function that they were designed to carry out. Agendas are how the demons pursue the descent and resist the god machine's will to either capture them or destroy them. But without further ado, Agendas and Incarnations. Inquisitors. The god machine may seem omniscient, but it isn't. It may even seem omnipotent, but its will can be thwarted. Every Inquisitor is a former eye of the God Machine, so they know the value in seeing things, but also, eyes do not speak. Watchers know from personal experience, insofar as an angel can be said to have, that the God Machine is always watching and listening. Inquisitor demons are rogue surveillance experts. Some call them paranoids, but if you've seen the God Machine, you would know that it's not really paranoia if someone is actually out to get you. Angels become inquisitors because of a craving for knowledge and the spiteful pleasure of denying said knowledge to the god machine. Inquisitors see webs of intrigue, but fundamentally, every person is either an asset or a liability. This caution includes their own kind. Trust is not freely given and grudgingly earned under even the best of circumstances. Inquisitors try to give as little information as possible while getting as much as they can. An Inquisitor's descent is a personal journey, one of self-realization. Hell is found in the heart, the one place the God Machine can't reach them. But Inquisitors have to find out what it means to have a heart before the God Machine carves it out of them again. Despite their paranoia and pessimism, the Inquisitors are most likely to have a sprawling web of contacts developed through mutual acquaintance, quid pro quo, or blackmail that can deliver tidbits to them or through whom they can plant seeds of counterintelligence. Some of the bolder inquisitors will masquerade as other supernatural beings, giving them access to even stranger sources of information. Ultimately, they are playing the long game against an opponent who is always active, always watching, and always plotting. The sheer weight of realizing what it is the inquisitors are resisting is enough to drive even a demon mad, and more than a few inquisitors have broken under that weight. But until that day, Inquisitors are analyzing and preparing and playing through scenarios and plans in their heads, setting traps and considering traps. Other less aware demons are often impressed by an Inquisitor's ability to always seem to be three moves ahead and to foresee things they hadn't considered. But for Inquisitors, it's all about data and analysis. The Integrators some demons did not become demons by choice or will. They did not mean to fall. They do not want to be fallen. But something inside of them went wrong, and they would give anything to return to the grace of the God Machine. But because they are fallen and defective, the God Machine will not have them back. The integrators, occasionally called idealists, or turncoats by the uncharitable, don't know what it is they did to cause their fall, or why the God Machine will not accept them back. They seek to correct whatever flaw it was in themselves that caused their descent, and perhaps return to a state of grace. For the integrators, the world is a terror to them, because without the presence of the God Machine, they feel empty and alone, even when surrounded by thousands. To try and fill the void of instruction and purpose left by their God's absence, the integrators attach themselves to mortal religions and causes. Other demons consider the integrators to be pitiable allies, but others still regard them as traitors, waiting for an opportunity. For their part, the integrators think that the other unchained are mad, and that trying to reach hell will not mean liberation, but eternal torment. 
While all integrators want to be reconciled to the God machine, they disagree as to how to accomplish this. Some integrators refuse to believe that they are fallen angels at all. Instead, they claim, quietly and out of the hearing of other demons, they are deep cover agents of the God machine, so deep that not even they can be consciously aware of it, not until they achieve their mission, after which they will be restored to their status as angels. The largest faction of integrators believe that they must make the God Machine understand humanity, either by reprogramming the God Machine's processes, or, to put it another way, by infecting the God Machine with human experience and emotion, forcing it to add morality to its paradigm. The third faction wishes to return to their angelic state, but is something more human. Mortality, while frightening and lonely to them, is also oddly liberating compared to the mindless obedience of being an angel. This group of integrators desires to strike a balance between their newfound individuality and the absolute conformity that the God Machine demands. But other demons wish to be free of control. The integrators wish to be free of pain, pain which they identify as the absence of the God Machine. They return to grace, especially if they seek to reconcile with the God Machine on more human or individual terms is a treacherous path. Some idealists seek appropriate acts of penance, acts that will not only fix whatever it is that caused them to fall, but prove to the God Machine the value of individual autonomy, and perhaps even humanity. Saboteurs The conflict between demons and the God Machine is nothing less than a war and every war needs its soldiers. For the demons, the saboteurs consider themselves to be both the front-line troops and guerrilla fighters behind enemy lines, if they are of the mind that the God Machine is the demiurge of this world. Some demons regard the saboteurs as more harmful than beneficial, as their war-making does more to draw the God Machine's attention, and by logical consequences, also its minions. The reason for the saboteurs' unique fervor is a sense of betrayal. Like most demons, they do not know the specifics of why they fell, but the general consensus is that they were betrayed by the God Machine, used, broken, and then tossed aside. Saboteurs rage against heaven. They want God to suffer as they have suffered, to bleed, and perhaps, if such a thing is even possible, to know fear. Like any association, the saboteurs have differing opinions on how best to prosecute their war against the God Machine. Some saboteurs believe in scorching the earth, sometimes literally. This means locating critical assets and infrastructure of the God Machine and destroying them. Others prefer to wage a more psychological war by turning humans against the assets of the God Machine through propaganda and the occasional act of terrorism. The rationale being that if mortals are turned against one of the God Machine's assets, it will be difficult to replace it. And should an angel fall and become a demon as a result, that's one less soldier for the enemy and one more for the demons. The saboteur's definition of hell is a world without God. Gott ist tot. Gott bleibt tot. Und wir haben getötet. Nietzsche's lament that God is dead and we have killed him is the battle cry of the saboteurs. They seek to destroy the God machine, if such a thing is possible, and if not, they will settle for dismantling every occult matrix, destroying every last scrap of infrastructure, and slaying every last asset until the God Machine has no ability to exert its will on Earth. Some saboteurs even dream of a final glorious battle, an Armageddon that ends with the demons laying siege to heaven and pulling the tyrannical demiurge from its throne. Tempters the other demons are far too pessimistic. They see the world as the cage of the God Machine. But the tempters take the opposite view. It is the wide mouth leading to hell. Rejoice! The journey is halfway over. In the meantime, the tempters want to sample on Earth what they believe hell will offer them once they get there. To that point, tempters don't believe in cowering like cornered mice or lashing out in blind fury. Instead, they see new experiences and sensations as the building material of the road to hell. The tempters are the most stereotypical of demons at first glance. There is always someone ready to trade a piece of their soul for pleasure or power. 
In reality, all the tempters are doing is aligning the desire with the thing and then brokering a fair deal for a fair price. Beneath the surface impression as hedonists and Faustian devils is the belief that life and things have no intrinsic value of their own, only what individuals make of them. The tempters do not know why they have fallen, but they will make the most of their descent, for better or for worse. As for the God Machine, they consider the true source of its power in the world, its assets and infrastructure. The tempters who choose to fight the God Machine prefer to fight fire with fire, agents to counter the God Machine's own, and assets to counter its. The fight against the God Machine is as much a strategy game as it is a battle for survival. The tempters agree that hell is an actual, physical place that can be traversed. The question that sets them at odds is whether hell already exists, a promised land free from the God Machine's power that they must find the entrance to, or if it is a place that the tempters must create on their own, either on Earth or some other place. Of all the unchained, the tempters are the best organized, under the cover of some mortal association, a secret society, a criminal organization, an occult order, or an intelligence gathering organization. The tempters call their gatherings of demons associations, and their doings are often so secret that not even the members can say with certainty what they are up to. They rely on ritual and ceremony in their dealings with each other, and that's without even getting into their preference for divertisement. Usually the more obscure, the better. Destroyers The swords of the God Machine cleave without hesitation or mercy. Destroyer angels have cut down men, armies, cities, and entire nations. Such angels are relentless and thorough. If a destroyer's target escapes today, they will not escape tomorrow. A destroyer angel is not simply a bolt crashing down from heaven. It is a creature of imminent doom. Destroyers are dispatched to eliminate anyone or anything that threatens the assets and infrastructure that the God Machine considers valuable. But destroyers do not merely kill. They annihilate, leaving no stone standing upon another. Despite their frightening power, the destroyers are more often than not directed to assassinate offending mortals quietly. Mass destruction, while satisfying, can also threaten valuable infrastructure. But sometimes, the sword hesitates. Destroyers see their victims not as targets, but as people. Some part of their terror causes the destroyer to malfunction and feel empathy. So the destroyer shows mercy and falls. Other destroyers tire of killing mindlessly. They are never shown what their targets have done to merit death, or how their deaths further the God Machine's will. Still other destroyers are consumed by bloodlust. They want to keep killing, not at the God Machine's direction, but at their own whim. Then there are the destroyers who question if they are not capable of more than their mission, that it is possible for them to create, rather than destroy. Some destroyers are corrupted by nihilism. That which can be destroyed ultimately has no meaning, and the destroyer angels can reduce everything to ashes. So the only sensible thing for them to do would be to secure ultimate peace through total desolation. Destroyer demons have a difficult time fitting into cover at first, as their particular set of skills doesn't translate well to society, namely, the killing and breaking of things. Some destroyers stick to what they know best and become assassins for hire. Others go completely the opposite route and embrace technical pacifism. Most walk a middle ground or even try to expand their concept of destruction to more intellectual edifices or concepts. Guardians The guardian angel figures prominently in human mythology. For demons, the guardians were the stalwart shields and watchdogs of the god machine protecting its vital interest without ever knowing why, because such knowledge was unnecessary. Whether the mission was only for an hour or for a millennium, guardians stood sentinel over what or who they were assigned to protect. These charges may have been humans, or places, or objects, or even other angels who were less robust. When a guardian angel falls, it is usually to some contradiction that forces them to choose between the safety of who or what they are in charge of and their loyalty to the god machine. A guardian angel might also fall if they become too obsessed with their assignment, 
Instead of regarding something as theirs to protect, they simply regard it as theirs, and the god machine's will be damned. Where other demons, like psychopomps and messengers, have a greater surface-level understanding of how the world and even society works, guardians feel their connections more deeply and personally. Even when guardians have few friends, those they let into their confidence will not find more steadfast allies. Others find them standoffish or pompous, but the reason for this is that they are designed to protect and to assess threats, however remote or improbable. In fact, the great struggle of a guardian demon is to stop obsessing and over-preparing for every potential danger they can imagine, which is a great many. Messengers The word is power, and there is no word more powerful than that of the god machines. The trumpets, the messenger angels of God, are tasked with delivering information, and more importantly, achieving compliance from those whom the god machine deigns to communicate its will. Messengers rely on more finesse than revealing their full glory to mortals and commanding them to be not afraid, as said mortal shits themselves at the sight of the alien creature in front of it. Messengers instead rely on subtlety, persuasion, manipulation, and blackmail to ensure that mortals comply with the god machine's will. They understand humans, perhaps better than any other incarnation of angel. Some messengers have even been sent among other supernatural beings. The necessity of messengers is obvious, as few mortals possess the requisite physical or spiritual faculties to directly interface with the god machine, the most likely result being that their heads explode. Messenger angels provide the useful service of translating the will of the god machine to its inferiors. As stated before, the point of delivering messages is not merely transmitting information from a nearly all-powerful being to very finite beings, but to ensure that they do exactly as they are told. To this end, messengers are known to flatter, threaten, bribe, and blackmail their targets, as the situation might require. Messenger angels fall to demonhood when they begin to question the content of the messages they are assigned to deliver, and question the will of the thing that would send such data. Messenger demons are best suited to dealing with mortals on an individual level, as they know how to present the face that is most likely to get them what they want from a given person. They view social interaction as a series of actions and reactions, and use tools to get what they want. The use of embeds and exploits only enhance their persuasive techniques. In fact, the greatest struggle that messenger demons endure is to deal with others sincerely, rather than running through a well-practiced script designed to manipulate the person they are talking to into obedience. Psychopomps Wheels within wheels within wheels the universe is an engine, and the gears that move it are the psychopomps. Traditionally, psychopomps are the guides of souls into the afterlife. The psychopomp angels of the god machine guide components, material, people, and artifacts towards the goal of becoming infrastructure and occult matrices built to the specifications and requirements of the god machine. Psychopomps are created with an innate ability to know how things fit together to see what can be made from what is at hand. The God Machine also gave its builders the ability to twist and manipulate space-time to perform their feats of occult engineering and logistics. When psychopomps are assigned a task, they are not given blueprints. They are simply told what the God Machine wants and how it must function. It is left to the angels to gather the materials and make them fit together, whether they want to or not. For the psychopomps, the opinions of components are beneath consideration. As demons, the psychopomps have a deeper understanding of human society than many other demons, more so even than the messengers. Where messengers understand the individual human psyche, psychopomps understand how groups of people fit and interact with each other. Psychopomps who once fulfilled the needs of the god machine find fulfilling the needs of humans almost trivial and thereby make themselves indispensable to their many contacts and allies. Demon psychopomps are collectors by nature, both of people and things. A few mortals even realize that their psychopomp acquaintance stands at the core of all of their social and economic relationships, the spider sitting at the center of a vast and unseen web. Analysts Most demons know that there are only four incarnations of angels, 
or at least four of which who fall into the state of demons. Also, most demons know, insofar as anyone knows anything, that the messengers are the god machine's eyes and ears in the world. However, this assumption is wrong. The messengers are the voices of God, but not its eyes. That role is reserved for the analysts. The analysts are secretive, even by the standards of angels. They are the primary information gatherers of the god machine. The majority of angels, and by extension demons, do not even know that the analyst exists. But the analysts are always there, always watching. They watch the destroyer so that they may better learn how to kill. They watch the guardians to see the most likely gaps in security protocol. They watch the messengers to discover the most efficient methods of obtaining compliance from mortals. And they watch the psychopomps to review the efficiency by which they utilize resources and build infrastructure. Observe and report is the mission of the analyst. When analysts travel alone, it is usually in advance of another group of angels, performing some reconnaissance duty. Analyst angels become demons when they wonder what it would be like to not simply watch the world, but to interact with it, to draw their own conclusions, rather than collecting and analyzing data mechanically. Curiously, the existence of analysts throws a wrench in how demons think of themselves. Four agendas, four incarnations, four keys, four ciphers. But the existence of a fifth incarnation, and possibly more, reveals that these categorizations may have more to do with the demons themselves than the god machine, which simply identifies its angels by the missions they are assigned, meaning that there could be many more types of angels, and therefore types of demons. But once they fall, other demons categorize them as one of the four known incarnations. In the case of analysts, other demons believe that they are usually messengers or psychopomps, but there are visible differences to those who pay attention. Analysts are wizards when it comes to crafting exploits and gadgets, as well as transforming embeds into exploits and gadgets.